Lovely. That was Toccata and Fugue in D minor by J.S. Bach, right? That's right. I have normally heard that piece associated with Halloween. Is that the case? Did Bach write it for Halloween? So um, most people do associate it with Halloween. Uh, a lot of people say, can you play that tune from Phantom of the Opera? But uh, it actually had no connections to Halloween. Uh, it is the Toccata. Uh, from Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D minor. Um, toccata is uh, a word meaning to touch. It, it means playing lots of notes very rapidly. Toccatas are usually fairly free and improvisatory. And uh, the story goes that this is the kind of piece that Bach might have improvised when he would go to try out a newly constructed organ. He wanted to find out how the keys felt, were they heavy, were they light, was the action responsive, did the pipe speak rapidly enough when he played quickly, how was the winding system, did it have enough air pressure to sustain uh, as he built up chords from the bottom up, adding more and more notes, bringing more and more pipes into play. Um, so. Uh, we don't know if that uh, story is actually based. In fact, it's kind of like a preacher's story. You know, it sounds good and makes a good point, but we don't <laughs> even know if it's true. Yeah, that's right. But, but it makes a great point. So it's a piece then that has been interpreted lots of different ways. In fact, one of the times it became even more famous was that it was included in the Disney Fantasia movie. That's right. So it was orchestrated then. The organ piece was written for an orchestra. Did that influence your interpretation of how you just played that for us? Uh, in a word, yes, yes. You know, the word interpretation is so wonderful because uh, what it says is the composer gives us a blueprint. The composer gives us uh, the notes, the rhythm, certain expression, uh, and then it's the role of the performer to take that and breathe life into it, respecting what the composer offers uh, but going for the, um, the spirit of the law and not necessarily the letter of the law in every case. Uh, so that brings up lots of questions for the organist. Um, what kind of pacing, how fast or slow to play certain parts, uh, what kind of sounds to use, which stop should I pull, uh, and that we call registration. Um, all those sorts of things go into uh, my interpretation of this piece. And I have to say, it's influenced by a lot of different things. Um, I love Leopold Stokowski's transcription of that for the Philadelphia Orchestra that he then recorded for the movie Fantasia. Um, there are all sorts of uh, dramatic crescendo effects that he does on certain notes that uh, would not have necessarily been done on an instrument Bach knew in his day. So could you show us a little bit of that? Could you show us how you use the organ to create some of those orchestration effects? Certainly. So I could just pull on a group of stops, a, a plenum, a kind of full Baroque sound, and play. And that's a, a kind of iconic sound that Bach would have known. Um, and in, probably the kind of sound that lots of organ professors would teach. Exactly, exactly. And that's always a great starting point to, to listen with ears that hear what the composer knew and had in mind. Um, of course, I love the Leopold Stokowski uh, orchestration of that. And so what I like is to play that opening mordant, those th first three notes, and then have a crescendo, which is a decidedly uh, non-organic way of doing it. It's more orchestral, but I think it's quite exciting. Yeah, show, so, us, show us how you make that happen. So yes, I, I draw on a certain number of unenclosed stops uh, where I can't control the volume, but I have a lot of stops that are enclosed in the swell boxes. I start with the swell boxes closed. And during that long sustained note, I can open these swell boxes that open the Venetian blinds, the swell shutters, letting that sound out and thereby creating that crescendo, which gives 
to me, on a note that would otherwise be static, it gives it energy and forward motion. As any good orchestral conductor would expect of their players. Right, right. exactly. So you made some choices like that in terms of the sounds you chose. You also made some choices rhythmically uh, that were not perfectly square. Yes. Tell me about those choices yes. you made. So um, given that a toccata is kind of the, um, it's the prelude to the fugue. The fugue is, is uh, quite um, more strict compositionally, more uh, steady, uh, steady tempo, steady rhythm throughout. Um, the toccata is much more free. It's meant to be a contrast to that. And in a lot of ways, if you think about rhetoric and the way uh, someone would give a speech, the opening is supposed to grab people's attention. Uh, and then later on, you start giving all the reasons and making the points and, and backing those up with evidence. But the Takata is really meant to say, listen to this, I have something important to say. So can you give us an example of how you did not just pick one steady tempo and steady? So in, in the Takata, there is that kind of freedom that one can employ. Um, and one of the, the places of that uh, is, if you played exactly what was written, it would just be. And tell us about how you played it. And so I like to start slowly and let it gather momentum. And pulling back a little bit at the end. So it gives a kind of shape. and. In, in my feeling, that also breathes some life into it. It's, it's natural with the flow, just like a, a person giving a speech would maybe start at one certain tempo and then increase the energy so that the listener is engaged throughout. And thus the interpretation of a piece of Bach that can sound completely different in 100 people's different hands, it could sound 100 different ways exactly. with those kinds of choices. And that to me is one of the most exciting things about music, and for me as an organist, is that it, it ultimately is all about communication. Um, I take uh, the music and then I try to figure out how do I communicate to bring this alive, to connect with, to engage the listener? So I'm always thinking um, of how best to do that. Um, you know, just as a person giving a speech is going to consider his or her audience uh, and, and knowing how best to make the point with that particular audience, I'm also considering the people who are listening. Are they all organists? Are they churchgoers, some of whom may love music, some may know nothing about music? Um, what what is my audience and then knowing that the organ is the instrument it's the tool for which through which i can express um, i then consider this organ is not exactly like box organ this one has certain capabilities it has certain sounds and colors that box did not uh, it has certain capabilities that box did not um, it's not to say that uh, it's that one is inherently better or worse, it's just different. And so that gives me a different set of tools that I could use expressively and interpretively to connect with the audience or the congregation. That's wonderful. You're certainly a technical wizard, but I would say you are a genius at connecting with audiences. And we want you to know that we here at Preston Hollow Presbyterian Church know that, appreciate that, and love you for that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.
Bradley, thank you so much for playing for us today. We thoroughly enjoyed this time together. You're most welcome, Steve. It's always a pleasure to be with you. And we hope you'll join us for our next episode.